Oh, wow. What's this? It is me. <laughs> oh, I've never been more excited in my life. Okay. Hi, everybody. How are you? I am doing well. This is Heather Alexandra for Kotaku.com, a video game website about video games. And we are going to play... Um, we're going to start playing, and we're going to play throughout the, the uh, early parts of 2019, uh, Skies of Arcadia. This is a 1999, uh, 2000, I believe, uh, JRPG that came out for the Sega Dreamcast. It is my favorite game of all time. Um, it is a tremendously important game to me. A super uh, tremendously important game to me. So I want to share it all with you. Um, we're gonna see the opening here. It's all very exciting. Um, so the nice thing is I'm gonna talk a lot about this game and all sorts of stuff and probably get all weird and emotional about it throughout the playthrough. Not that emotional, but a little. Um, this game starts out really cliche, by which I mean you have played, um, you have played a lot of uh, JRPGs with these tropes. This game does them really well, really honestly, and then around the last two acts, around Act 4 and Act 5, they start playing with them a little bit. Uh, Sony's saying, your screen is banding pretty badly. I'm keeping it at an original aspect ratio. I've introduced slightly a little bit more scan lines in order to give it a little bit of what I feel is a more authentic kind of feel. Uh, I'm streaming this right off of a Dreamcast. I am putting it through an RGB Mini Frame Meister, upscaling from, I think the Dreamcast's default output is um, 480p. The PlayStation 2 is 480i, so it might be 480i. One of the two, 480i, 480p. Um, this is actually being upscaled into 1080p, but I'm keeping it at its original aspect ratio adding a little bit of extra lines to the screen to kind of give it this pseudo retro feel. Uh, Skies of Arcadia, we'll get to it. Uh, it is about air pirates. It is about bad guys and good guys. It is about good guys winning because that's what good guys do. And that's really cool. Um, I, I really appreciate stories, especially nowadays where good people do good things. <laughs> Um, where heroes are heroic and do heroic things because that's just what happens. Um, this game is sweeping. It is operatic. It is um, wonderful and beautiful and bold. The soundtrack is amazing. The writing's really good. Um, and it is an absolute crime. It is an absolute goddamn crime. This is the biggest chance you're gonna see me to like full-on proselytizing it's a goddamn crime this is not on pc you can play a bad port of grandia 2 on your pc you can play silver on your pc which is not that great of an rpg um all things considered and uh you can't play this uh except oh you know you, great uh you can play as vice in sonic all-star racing transformed uh, which, you know, great game. I like that game a lot, but Sega knows this game exists. So Vise, Ica, and Fina are in Valkyria Chronicles. This is a good game. It is a very good RPG that was popular at the time and people are still big fans of now. I have a tattoo from this game on my arm. And Sega will not let me play it on my goddamn PC. Um... To me, a very biased party, that is the most bizarre thing ever. Um, it really, really bums me out. Uh, bums me out a ton. You can probably hear, this is my controller rumbling, by the way. I have this extra rumble pack in my controller, and it's very, very loud. Yeah, we have a port of Shenmue now. A pretty decent um, port of Shenmue. There's a GameCube version of this that was made that had extra stuff. We're playing on the Dreamcast version for a very simple reason, and it's a very, for some people, a petty reason. Uh, the music is better in this. In order to get everything onto the GameCube, they had to compress the audio significantly to fit on the mini discs. Uh, that game is on two discs, two mini discs. Uh, this is on just two normal uh, GD-ROMs. 
or you know the weird CD whatever things that they had. And I would rather have better audio and better music than some of the extras. It's like significantly, it's a huge difference. It's a massive difference. The difference between listening to an orchestra and listening to like fucking MIDI. Aha. So these are the bad guys, or at least one of the bad guys. This is Alfonso. Uh, Alfonso says, ha ha ha. We've fine, I'm gonna do bad voice acting this entire goddamn playthrough. We've finally found her. Admiral Alfonso. Her ship's in range of our cannons. Excellent. Prepare to fire concussive... <laughs> I love Alfonso. Um, prepare to fire concussive shells on my command, but avoid hitting her ship directly. We need her alive so we can question her. This did have a VMU thing that you could do a bunch of stuff with. Fire! And he fires the cannons. You can tell how I'm excited I am on this. How about this goddamn game? So good. Uh, it starts off with bad guys messing with our white mage. Although we don't really know who she is yet. Uh, also airships. Very, very good airships. Airship battles in this game. Very, very good. Uh, Alfonso, yes, total douchebag. But uh, a very fun villain in a lot of ways. She's not a princess, though, but, you know. It is a very Star Wars opening. Your Excellency, the girl has been knocked unconscious, but she's unharmed. She's been taken aboard our ship. I won't do actual, like, real voice acting. I just want to for a second. <laughs> the Empress will be very pleased with me. I'm sure to be rewarded rather handsomely, I might add. I'll just normal, normal read it. Uh, what? Where did that come from? It sounded like an explosion. Status report now. The lower hall has been hit. Someone is attacking us. Uh, is it the good guys? I hope it's the good guys. Uh, attacking us? Who would dare attack a vessel of the Imperial Armada? The Armada is basically this version, this uh, uh, settings version of like Spain. But it's also stand in for broadly most of Europe. Uh, there's a small ship heading off to the clouds to the port side. That flag, air pirates. Really good entrance by our uh, main main characters here. Um, so there are a lot of moments in games that are very important for us to keep, uh, <laughs> keep note of. Um, anytime you meet a new character, the context in which they're introduced, it's right. That's storytelling 101. But in a game, it's really important, especially if it's a character you're going to be playing a lot of time with. That's why we re we remember. You know, Dante's opening scenes in Devil May Cry 3 or something, because they're that fucking good. This is also that fucking good. Um, sets up the stakes nicely, bad guys, good guys, piracy, wonderful music, and we understand our protagonist characters right away. He says, of course I know that I'm robbing the Armada, that's why we attacked your ship. You guys have the best stuff. Wonderful line. I'm Vise of the Blue Rogues, and in a few minutes, I'll be, re I'll be relieving you of all your valuables. The bad guys, ah, you're all, you're brave or stupid attacking us. And then, of course, another one of our protagonists, Aika. They are cheerful. They are adventurous. They are everything that I love in super awesome sweeping uh, RPGs like this. Not to say I don't like darker, more reflective RPGs, but this is, this came out after Chrono Cross, or around the time of Chrono Cross, and a little bit after Final Fantasy VII, which was a period when JRPGs were really getting reflect, like self-reflecting, and they were getting very metatextual. And this was, in the same way that Mass Effect can be seen as sort of a recreation, a reconstruction of older sci-fi tropes that had kind of become seen as kind of gauche um, as things have progressed. This is a reconstruction of traditional JRPG form and it does it really, really well. The combat system, how does this work? Very simple, you have an attack, you have a special attack, but you need to use at the top of your screen spirit points in order to use your things. So you have a couple things you can do. At the end of every turn, you get spirit points based upon the amount of characters in your party. Um, if you want to, you can have your characters focus, which actually grants spirit points, but costs them an action during the turn. 
It's mostly beneficial to have certain characters that can focus and generate more spirit points be the ones who focus on a turn while your heavy hitters attack. Very simple. Um, magic. I don't have any working magic right now. How does magic work? Everything's based on a very simple elemental wheel. Um, and right now I only have access to red magic and green magic. Red magic is fire magic and buffs. Green magic is healing and some status effects. Uh, we will get more moon crystals and stuff as we progress. We will attack people. Straightforward combat system. Really good combat system. Um, not too complicated. Works out real well. So for instance, I can have Ika focus to get some extra SP. Bias can attack. We can repeat that process because these guys aren't going to damage us too much at all. Big thing in this game that uh, was kind of newer at the time too was this idea of um, not just characters moving around the battlefield, that had been done before. Um, I mean, we played Star Ocean 2, which is where you have direct control over character position, but here it was more dynamic, um, you know, camera uh, movements and things like that that were kind of baked into the fighting. Another thing that also happens, this is going to be most prevalent in boss fights, uh, boss fights when we get to them, is that the music dynamically changes to reflect the situation of the battle. We might actually um, win here without getting to use a special attack. Uh, congrats on the counterattack, Aiko. But if you're doing good against the boss, the music uh, reflects that. If you're doing bad against the boss, the music changes dynamically again to reflect that as well. So there's a lot of movement and a lot of action happening in the combat system, and there's just enough resource management to make it something active and exciting. Um, it's not complicated to get your head around. It looks good in motion. To me, that's the mark of a pretty good JRPG combat system. Some people like complexity. I would rather have depth, um, by which I mean I would have greater complexity with the least amount of actual complication. I think something is deep or therefore actually elegant in game design when you can have lots of potential modes and range, range, ranges of interaction um, without having to inundate, like, inundate your player with an excess of systemic knowledge that they need to balance. Um, that's not what JRPGs are really great at. JRPGs are really good at abstraction, uh, using numbers to represent actions and deeds and things like that. Uh, this guy says, what do you think the two of you can do against the five of us? And we get another great entrance from your dad. This is Dine. He says, I think you miscounted. I only see four of you. He says, we'll take care of these guys. Make your way to the bridge and shut down the engines. And when we're out here, remember, it's Captain, not Dad. Got it? Aye, aye, Captain. And then they go. Uh, but yes, uh, I'm very enthusiastic right now. I'm very excited to share this with you. And I will be talking about this game a lot as we progress. I won't always be reading the dialogue. Um, I will try not to speed through the dialogue too fast. Sometimes I will read it. Um, Let's go. But I will use this stream primarily as an opportunity to talk about this really interesting game and why I think it's doing good things. Um, and I hope that very hastily thought out primer on the combat system gives some idea about what I uh, care about when I'm playing. Uh, an RPG like this. Uh, one thing that's weird about the motions here is to move the camera. I'm actually hitting my left and right triggers on the Dreamcast controller because the Dreamcast controller has one offset analog stick. Um, uh, on the Dreamcast controller, if you're not familiar, it has an analog stick and right below it, it has a D-pad. And then on the right side of the controller, you have your A, B, X, Y buttons. Um, there's this big blank spot where you could have, in theory, put a dual stick, uh, but that was not really popular yet um, until uh, the dual shock actually made that happen. Uh, will I be playing the whole game, not in one sitting? Yes, I intend to play all of this game. Uh, we should get, oh, yeah, Alfonso talks. Well, well, air pirates have decided to infest my ship. And he gets to be all mean. And 
yeah, he's a total asshole. This game is dual discs on the Dreamcast, but each disc is pretty beefy, um, all things considered. Uh, and like I said, you're not compressing the audio to fit onto a mini disc like you were on the uh, GameCube. I'm Alfonso, cherished son, <laughs> I can't even talk today, cherished son of Valua's most distinguished family and an admirable, admiral of the Imperial Armada. There's a lot of gameplay, I'm not going to be playing it all at once. Uh, normally, low lives such as yourself would never have the opportunity to bask in such greatness. Consider yourself fortunate. And then they ask, who's the girl? Um, it's darker because we're inside a ship and there are no real lights. Um, one thing I can do in the future streams is actually try to uh, increase the, the brightness on my end a little, but it's this section is a little dark at first. He so says, strange. dispose of them. We gotta fight some bad guys. It starts off dark so that they can toss in the red later. Alfonso is a really good, like, starting villain. Because um, there's a lot of people in the Valua Armada who are, like, kind of buffoonish. But, like, some of them are buffoons but tough. Alfonso is just a buffoon. He's a good low-tier villain. And I really enjoy him and pretty much all the other characters in the game, too. Uh, none of them have learned magic yet. For the record, you can change your um, camera angle a little bit in combat. And then you can also change your elements in combat. There ends up being, I believe, six elements altogether. So if you need to, in a fight, you can switch to whatever element you need. You can also, um, you can also, you have to have that type of element equipped to get experience in magic um, at the end of a battle. So if I want red magic, like I do for Vise right now, I'm gonna keep him using the red moonstone. Uh, eventually, the minute we get the purple moon soon, I'm going to give that to Aika. Um, because Aika's special attacks already are big area of effect attacks. And purple magic, which is ice magic, tends to do that as well. Um, if you've played the game a couple times, you get to know sort of which synergies kind of work well for characters. It's tempting to say, hey, what we need is... Um, everybody to specialize in every element, you know, to have as many spells as possible. And the idea is, no, you just need people to specialize in the right way. Right, so there, so there's um, red, blue, yellow, green, purple, and silver is the color uh, split there. Fi uh, red is fire magic and buffs. Blue is um, healing magic. Uh, or excuse me, um, green is healing magic. Blue is um, water magic, but mostly speed buffs. Uh, purple is ice and some status effects. Silver is death, which means reviving characters, but also a lot of instant death spells as well. Um, what do I have for... You can always go into first person to look around your environment too, which is always very nice. Let's grab some treasure. Found some treasure! That's a different character in this game who says that later. His name is Domingo. I want full health because we're going to go up to um, a boss fight in a minute. Which will give us a chance to talk about the combat system a little bit more. Uh, we might hit a random battle here. Random battles are... Yeah. And actually, one thing that people know about that I can hear, but you probably can't, maybe you can, is when a random battle is going to happen on the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast is a very loud console, so I can hear the CD whirring up to load in the fight. And one thing you can do, or you can try to do, is stop moving to not give the disc a, a chance to load and you can avoid random battles that way. This game is notorious for its amount of random battles, especially in the overworld. It's massive, it's a ton. So much so that one of the big selling points for 
um, Skies of Arcadia Legends on the GameCube was they reduced the amount of um, random encounters. It was actually like a selling point. They were like, we have all this extra content. Also, you're not fighting loopers and shit as much. Um, that change never really affected the difficulty of the game, um, one way or the other. Maybe addressed some of the tedium, but I, I never found it too bad anyway. Um, it's just something you sort of adjust to. Fights, fights are pretty quick, experience is always welcome, and if you're lucky, an enemy will drop like a moon berry or something, which you can use to unlock special abilities, and that's really what you want. Um, plus, I like the combat system. Also, this is really nice because an RNG battle beforehand meant that I unlocked enough magic, you know, experience on my green crystal for Ika to give me a healing spell. Just in case I, I don't know, somehow managed to eat shit in the boss fight up ahead, which would be surprising, but is possible. Having some extra healing magic is great, so thank you, Random Encounter. Um, as we get introduced to two characters, I'm going to talk about them. Specifically, I'm going to talk about Fina a lot. I have one of her tattoos I'm going to get more soon. Um, but also, Vise and Ika are just very honest and likable protagonists, which is helpful. Magic Droplet, which is good. I don't use those much in battle. Um, so one thing Skies of Arcadia is going to be really, really good about. Um, first off, let's save our game. On my visual memory unit. Um, one thing Skies of Arcadia is going to be very, very good at is actually using 3D space and putting a lot of verticality into things. We're going to see this when we get to our first real dungeon outside of this, but you get to see a little bit of it here. Um, this is a game that actually uses uh, 3D space in, in ways that are interesting and makes your navigation around spaces kind of worthwhile. So how do we get to Alfonso? We go to the outside of the ship. We get this nice little camera angle. We climb our ladder uh, downward uh, instead of upwards, uh, sort of reverse Metal Gear Solid 3 style. Um, and we get a sense of these spaces as real spaces. Um, still sort of abstracted spaces, right? Because it's a video game. And I don't need to worry, you know, I don't need to do some sort of mini game where I have to worry about the wind or whatever, like I would in a modern game, but. Um, it helps give you a sense of scale. It helps give you a sense of place. It's better than just going through corridors, although we will have that from time to time in the game where we go through a lot of corridors. But in general, the dungeons in this game are good about using verticality to um, make your movement more interesting. In general, in games, especially in first-person shooters, going up and down is always very interesting. Um, going in a straight line, not always as great. It's one of the reasons that Doom just in terms of raw design is some is often better pretty much always better than wolfenstein 3d because um, wolfenstein 3d is smart but it's on a flat plane and your movement's not as dynamic um, in doom you have to deal with a lot more verticality and levels and it starts to add complexity and richness to your level design it's like that here except as um as a world building tool as opposed to like a combat encounter building tool um, it's something to keep a lookout uh, on in, in games in general with um, with just anything. Look at how they're using space. Look at how they're using height, um, very in particular. So Alfonso's an asshole. He says, I cannot tell the Empress that I lost my ship to the air pirates in a fair fight. I'm going to need a scapegoat, and you'll do quite nicely. To keep my glorious reputation from being tarnished, you must be sacrificed. He's going to pretend that the vice captain was working with the air pirates. And he gets a nice little villain moment. Chucks a guy off the edge. <laughs> um, our villains are good at being, or a lot of them are, are, are good at first at being like cheesy villains. We get more complexity in our narrative later on. Um, like I was saying earlier about how this game is sort of a reconstruction, for a while it treats its material very straightforward, um, kind of broadly. And then once it's established its world and let you sort of get to know characters, especially in the second half of the game, it starts to add a lot more complications um, that start to comment on the tropes that it was originally kind of embracing wholeheartedly. Um, this happens a lot with your final villains, 
Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff, stuff going on. We will get there eventually. I hope my commentary is not annoying. I'm very excited. This is the first time I've ever streamed and I've been like nervous to talk. Um, because, and I'll tell you 100% honestly, every time I try and talk about this game, I do not feel I'm, I, I don't feel I am doing a good enough job. Um, I've never found the words to express the things that I think this game is doing, why this game is something I give a shit about. Um, but uh, I hope my enthusiasm covers for that. Um, this is Alf uh, Alfonso's first personal war beast, uh, Antonio, I believe. Yeah, Antonio. It's our first boss. Our first boss fight. Um, really good stuff. We might get to hear some of the dynamic music here. We're gonna get to see some really good. Um, <laughs> we're gonna get to see some really good combat animations and special attacks to get used to them. Um, you can listen to this entire soundtrack, by the way, if you search for it on. Um, if you search for it on Spotify, I found this out the other day. You can listen to that and a lot of really good Sega soundtracks, and I highly recommend that you do. Um, so we're going to start off with some normal attacks. Uh, Aika has magic now, but we're going to focus with her, because the thing that we're going to do to whittle down this boss pretty quick is we're going to use Vise's first special ability, the ever-reliable, ever-useful Cutlass Fury. Wow, he started with Thunder Fury. It's... Super good that he was only targeting Vise there, though, because that attacks on an arc. Um, uh, so if Ika was standing behind Vise, for instance, that actually would have made my characters eat like a ton of damage. Um, the only downside about characters kind of moving autonomously on the battlefield is that there are times when attacks are based on positional things um, and you can't like dodge it, right? You can't be like, hey, I positioned my characters this way to dodge it. It's kind of luck, um, which is one of the only real downsides to this combat system that I really perceive. Um, this boss was actually uh, in a segment that you got to play on the demo disc, which at some point I should show you the demo disc version of all of this because it's loaded. There's a whole story montage thing. There's an air battle. There's a ton of stuff. This is Cutlass Fury, though. It's fantastic. And uh, to be kind of good, we'll just use this Sakri Crystal on Vise. If you have healing items, you might as well use them. Eventually, later on in the game, you're going to get rich. And you can buy as much shit as you need. And it's great. Um, but here's Cutlass Fury. This is some old school, wonderful JRPG nonsense, and I'm 100% here for it. Um, the same way that how, man, I really like just doing weird, wild power attacks in Lunar or something. They're less dynamic than in Lunar, but. Or, um, Lunar is less dynamic than Skies of Arcadia, but it's still pretty good. Lunar is another game that I could totally play through really easy. Oh, perfect. That critical attack could not have uh, been even better. So good. All right, so we're gonna continue our process from before. But now that we've done more damage, listen to, to the music for a second, because it actually gets different. Because the battle is turning in our favor. See, that's really good stuff. And if we were doing poorly, the game would have changed accordingly. Um, <laughs> a lot of boss fights have two different versions. One is called Crisis and one is called Opportunity. Uh, you can imagine when they are used. <laughs> uh, we are now listening to the normal boss fight theme uh, for Opportunity. This might knock it back down to Crisis, though. Hard to say. Um, but we should finish off this boss pretty quick. Oh, it missed. Kind of surprised. 
This might finish it, or we might need to do one more round. This could finish it here, though. Oh, it didn't do as much as I thought. We're just gonna just burn it down. Vise's attack here could get it. It might be right on the edge. Oh, wow. Magic pixel. Here we go. That's the end of it. Oh, we finished with a critical. Could not have choreographed that better if it was my job. Could not that wasn't have so choreographed that better if it was my fucking job. I love boss fights in this game. They're really fun. Um, like I said, there's just... It is my job a little bit. <laughs> um, there's just enough complexity to this system that I really enjoy. Moonberry, that's going to give us our, uh, our special attacks. You need to find moonberries in order to unlock more special attacks. We're going to give... Uh, we're going to unlock Ika's first one. Um, which uh, will be really, really great. <laughs> Um, and then he's, she's all like, oh, I'm Vice. I'm Vice of the Blue Rogues! Come back here, Alfonso! He's like that type of deal. He's like that type of dude. Which I always find fun. Um, if you put this into a CD player... Um, the disc, you should actually look it up. There's a, a version of, if you put it into the CD player, um, Vise, Ica, and Fina come on to tell you, like, hey, don't do that. The same way that you can do that with uh, Symphony of the Night and Alucard's, like, this is a PlayStation disc. Um, but Vise is like, put us back in the Dreamcast so we can do our job. And you're like, dude, calm down. Calm down, my buddy. Yeah, but with that Moonberry, we're going to unlock Alpha Storm, which is... Uh, Ika's special abilities are bonkers. They are um, they tend to attack multiple enemies. They're very, very good. Uh, hey, who's this girl? We've never seen anybody dressed like that before. I know who she is. God, such good music. This place, am I home? Here's where I'm gonna say it. It's Fina. The Japanese audio drama says Fina. I'm not into it. It's Fina. Um, one of Aika's ability is to nullify, well, it's to take half magic damage. She also has one that can nullify all um, instant magic spells. So, like, a lot of bosses will start using, um, instant death spells, and you need to use Ika's ability to negate that, or they'll kill you right away. It's, um, it's called Delta Shield. Uh, the alternate that you can use is there's another character you get in your party later called Gilder. He has an ability called Aura of Denial that does the same thing. Um, in case uh, you want to give Ika a free turn to use something else instead of just having her be like your defense magnet. Um, the game was smart, smart enough to give you a, uh, a character that um, gives you a, sort of a similar effect. Um, so this seems really good in the audio drama, by the way, like when Fina's first waking up. It's really good. Um, <laughs> If you understand a little bit of Japanese and you want to hear uh, something really cool, you can you can just find the audio drama online. It's really great. Uh, I have that forehead tattoo tattooed to my arm. I'm going to get her shoulder tattoo and another one from a character called Ramirez down the rest of my arm. So we say that. I'm Vise. Don't worry, there aren't any value in troops around, so you'll be safe here. She says thank you. says, hey, blue rogues are always here to help people. I love it. They're Robin Hood. Except 
pirates. Um, my name is Fina. And so we get our first thing here. So this happens too, which is um, throughout the game, you need to say the right things in order to increase your reputation. Your reputation affects all sorts of stuff throughout the game, including like shop prices and a couple other things, I believe. Um, uh, you want to say things that are genuinely heroic. You don't want to be like, that's a strange name. You want to say, that's a great name. You hear the little sound that says, hey, you did it right. And you hear the little thing that goes, blah, 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 means I increased the level. Fina, huh? That's a great name. It's so, so feminine. <laughs> it's not a very good compliment. At least Ika knows, tells him that. <laughs> I actually, so my tattoo on my arm is a little more squat than Fina's, it turned out, but I think it's still a pretty good tattoo. And so she asks them what an air pirate is, because Fina is not from around these parts. And they go, excuse me? So when you first meet Fina, um, your general impression is soft, demure, kind of doesn't know stuff. Um, a trope that we have seen on and on again. <laughs> and um, what happens very quickly is that you realize that um, Fina's status as outsider allows her to not just provide an entryway into the world so that we can get our lore dumps a little bit more naturally, although she is doing that. She's not an audience surrogate, but she's close. Um, she also exists on the periphery of the society and is able to comment on it. Um, later on, she's going to be like, I don't understand money. Like, what is this stupid thing? Um, and so one of Fina's roles ends up being surprisingly, or at least somewhat surprisingly, given the fact that maybe you wouldn't expect it from kind of the tropey version of the character that she could have been, she ends up being somebody who's very critical of like power structures, which is one of the things I really like about her as a character. Um, is that she she says like, "Hey, I understand what you're doing here, but also I don't. Like, what's up?" Um, she is she allows for a little bit more colorful commentary onto the actual like state of this world that's being built in the game, and I really like that. Um, It'd be very easy to just have her be a mysterious white magey character, but that's not always the case, and she starts to grow, um, which is really good. She also, if you do it properly, which I might not be able to do because I have, I, I might not be able to download the thing I need on my Dreamcast anymore. She also gets the strongest weapon in the game. Vise does not get the strongest weapon in the game. Fina does, um, which is really, really good. Um, I love the idea of a game that first builds up your tropes and then starts to subvert them. And one of the most obvious ways that Skies of Arcadia does that is by giving Fina the most powerful weapon in the game. It takes a lot of work, though. Luke the Raider. That raid was pretty good. It's been a while since we raided a valuant ship. He likes raiding. Oh, Cupel. You'll meet Cupel eventually, but we're going to have to go through a dungeon. And this is also going to give us our introduction to the overworld map, which is not, if you're familiar with, or maybe if you're unfamiliar with this, um, the way that the overworld map is handled in this game is really good. Um... on board it's not dad it's captain got it I, i'm not i'm not gonna read all the uh dialogue unfortunately Moobots. I, I should adjust the timer on that because it's being really aggressive on that like we got an rgb mini foker so we've been asked to take the helm of the ship and we're gonna learn a few things here on our trip first is that uh the overworld in this game is fantastic and we can talk about that design, too, a little bit. Um, I don't need to ask you anything. I know how to pirate a ship in this game. You can go down. You can go up. For now, you can't go below or above these cloud layers. Eventually, you will be able to. 
um, you can't go through those, eventually you will be able to. Your ships will upgrade in ways that are um, pretty wild. It's very gated. Look at that random encounter. Um, but as, you're, as you get access to different ships, as you upgrade your ship, suddenly the world expands. This is ultimately a game about exploration. Um, one thing I'm kind of glad that it doesn't end up being as much of, though, is a game about, like, colonization. Um, it's not perfect, but the way that Vise, Ika, and everybody else will go about approaching new worlds and new spaces and new people um, is, like, pretty good. And then you get Valua, who is bad. Um, in that sort of reductive anime villain way, which I guess means that the game comments on colonial stuff a little bit, but you know. Uh, one thing we want to know, too, is that throughout the world you're going to find... Discoveries. The more discoveries you find, uh, the more money you can make, the more um, uh, your pirate rank will increase. Um, each one of these has information on it. It's great. Um, your overworld is filled with like a hundred of these different hidden discoveries that you need to find. Some of them are obvious, some of them are not. Um, here we just found a grave for an unknown pirate. Um, and you go to the guild and you can make some money off of that. One of the big things about this game world that I like is discoveries as a sort of gameplay system encourage you to really explore and engage with the richness of the world. And give a sense that the world is this um, kind of new place to explore. I'm picking up some fish just because I can. Um. <laughs> I remember where a lot of discoveries are, but it's uh, gonna be a little hard on my brain um, I'll have to maybe read up on some things again. Um, and you do find uh, some things that are just like definitely unexplained. Like there are just giant... There's like a giant's throne and like a bunch of stuff. This isn't really a spoiler to talk about. But sometimes that stuff goes unexplained, except for the fact, like, you found this strange thing that kind of implies uh, a broader world. Like, what is up with that? In other cases, you'll get something um, a little more explicit. Um, but discovery, adventure, this game has a really good sense of it. Um, wow, he's beating up Ika. You saw before in our first fight, too, a thing called a looper. They tend to run as fast as you can. They're kind of like metal slimes um, from Dragon Quest, where they give a lot of experience, but they dodge attacks. Instead of like being tough, they dodge attacks. And um, if you see them, you want to take them out. One thing I'm actually kind of surprised by is the amount of... Um, how much the frame rate actually slows down a little bit on this, uh... On this. I'm just kind of flying around to give it a test. I also think that there are some other uh, uh, things for us to find here. But I might be wrong. How do you kill the looper? You're lucky. Or magic damage. It tends to not avoid magic damage. So once you have spells, you can start taking out loopers. Um... Also, the higher your level, the better your accuracy is going to be anyway. Um, so your stats either need to be su sufficient to, like, beat the dice roll against the looper, or you just have to be, like, really lucky. Um, really nice use of color in this game, just in terms of how it treats its sky and everything else. Ah, oh, Fina. Fina rules. She's so good. And again, we were talking about um, video game spaces okay. that will end up implying a lot more richness and complexity. Uh, when we get to um, Pirate Island, which we're going to in a minute, you're going to see that the space has like complexity to it besides just, it is a town. It is a town with a lot of stuff happening in it, um, which is nice. 
That's our base, Pirate Island. They named it a little bit uh, on the nose. But again, look, you can even see it right there though. It's an island with verticality because it's a game with floating land masses. But there's also stuff going on underneath that you'll see. Um, I don't know. I think this is an important game for people who are really interested in JRPGs to see what can happen when you kind of just like stick to the form and then experiment with like your fringes. Um, or when you build something up to kind of experiment with it afterwards. I think a lot of times games want to strike you very quickly with complex, like, oh man, we're so adult and complex. And honestly, sometimes you can get the most complexity by treating a thing earnestly, um, exploring it earnestly, and then, um, and then adding in your complications. Um, also it creates a mood that sets this, like one of the things that sets this game apart that I find very good about it is that it's just like, hey, you know what's nice, a nice game to play? Like this. Um, listen to that rumble pack. Oh boy. What was, was that the, the res trance vibrator? I don't know. Weapons, armor, gold. Now this is a great catch. I love treasure. They drink loca in this version, which is supposed to be like a fruit juice. It's wine. They're drinking wine, but it's one of those funny like Funimation. Oh man, look, Master Roshi's drinking a nice frothy mug of water, um, which is hysterical. I love it. I am definitely not going to read out all the dialogue, but you know. Code Veronica is not the best Resident Evil. It is a very good Resident Evil, though. I don't know if it's the best Resident Evil. My favorite Resident Evil. Best and favorite are different things, for the record. This is my favorite game. I don't think this is anywhere close to being the best game, but you understand what I mean. I think that happens with Resident Evil as well. My favorite Resident Evil is Resident Evil 3. I don't think it's the best Resident Evil necessarily, but this is my favorite. So Vi, Zyka, and Fina are like fantastic. Um, I love them. And one thing we will see later on, and I fully uh, think this is the case, and I will make an argument for that case later on in the uh, playthrough. Um, I think eventually they get to what is essentially a, the, one of the closest ways that a game has ever gotten to examining just like a very open um, friendship that edges into something more complicated um, insofar as like it tends to skirt the lines of polyamory, which is interesting. Um, these are people who just care about each other, and that's great. I really like that in games. Also, all your party members are just, like, really good. Our first party member we're gonna get after Fina is just, like... He's another character who starts off as a very clear cliché, and then whose story gets way more complicated. Um, right, he's basically Captain Ahab. But as we learn more about him, and as we learn more about what he's chasing, that old Captain Ahab story changes and gets tweaked. Um, this game, again, is very good about setting up a form or a roadmap that it then starts to play and um, experiment with, which I think is really good. She's never been to a tavern. She doesn't know what loca is. Oh, we'll get to that scene, positive touch. Box of feathers. 
Well, yeah, one of his one of his special abilities is is a zero cost ability that uh, is just a supercharged version of um, focus, which is really good. We're gonna get to a hard fight. Um, things. It's just a juice, but it tastes great. It's not just a juice. It's wine. The drink and booze. So it's tricky. I don't actually use. Uh, so somebody in chat is talking familiar with the game. I actually don't use Drachma very much in my final party. I tend to alternate between either having Enrique or Gilder. Um, I like Gilder a lot. Um, but you know, it's probably. I think Gilder is probably the le like least optimal character that you could possibly have in your final party. So Enrique tends to be the one. Because he also has Justice Shield, which is just really good. Justice Shield, a very good damage mitigating thing. Then you have Ika with her magic mitigation. And it's a very powerful team. Let's talk to dad. So one thing I'd like is something that Fina is going to do up here. Which is a small expression of me stressing that she is a, um, like an independent character of her own, which we'll see in a second. We're also going to have a, a Vise's, like a captain's choice here in a second. Because he's going to want to talk to Fina and be like, what's your deal? Why were they after you? Which is like, you know. Oh, God, every character in this game is, is sincere and, and enthusiastic in their own ways. So here's an interesting choice. You would think that like the heroic thing is like defender, but actually the swashbuckling choice that gets you the points is to sit quietly and let your captain do stuff. So one thing I like about Fina here, though, is that she says, very honestly and very firmly, I can't tell you. Um, there's a version of this where she just like, is like, here, oh, here's my story right away. And she's like, no, she stands firm. And I like it. It implies um, independence, um, where I think other games maybe might not have done it. Right? They might have taken the easy way out. We will learn about her quest, but, you know. But she's firm and honest with him, too. She says, like, don't want to endanger your life. If you believe me, like, please believe me when I'm telling you this. And Dine, to his credit, too, goes like, okay. But again, there's a version of that story beat that plays out with him, like, really asserting himself over, over this, like, demure woman character who just doesn't stand up for herself, and instead the game goes the other way. Which is nice. It's really, really nice. Small character moment, but it tells you a lot about these two. Thank you so much. And it doesn't rob Dine of any of his, like, authority or power, too. Yeah. Good stuff. I have to sneeze, friends. Achoo! There it is. 
snake eater. Someday you go through the rain. Some days you feed on a tree frog. Anytime I climb a ladder in a game, that plays in my head. It's, um... It's honestly kind of a problem. How do I get out of here again? I forget. Yeah, this definitely has, like, a Saturday morning cartoon feel. And then eventually you get to the season that's, like kind of when it grows its, like, teeth a little, and you're like, oh, cool. Like, it starts off very much like, hey, it's the pirate show, and then, then they're like, oh, what's all this? I don't know, it's good. And it treats its characters seriously, even if it treats its setting very broad. It would be so, so, so easy to make everything broad and trite and silly, and instead, I think the game really does show a lot of care, so... If you want to know what kind of writing really gets to me, that certainly helps. Yeah, there's a chest there. Oh, th I think there's the secret entrance outside. I'm gonna get lost. It doesn't matter, the music in this game is so good that no matter where you are, it's like... so good. Is it right just past where Dine is? Oh, it is. I missed the walkway. You can get a cham here later. Like around here or so. But I don't have access to chams yet. Because Fina's not technically in my party yet. Yeah, so I don't know. I did a Let's Play of this a long, like two years ago, three years ago now even. And one thing I talked about when I got to this segment is I, th I think it's important to kind of remind people to check out like a broader canon than just like the games that we tell everybody are important games. Like JRPG people are snobs. I know because I am one. But very often too, there are a lot of people who like are really into games who consider like and this i don't mean this in like a diff oh, god it's gonna sound like a fucking thing what i mean is that like you shouldn't just be like i've played all the final fantasies like if you want to study or at least if your desire is to like study games is to like you should really there's a hidden door here and um the thing that you should do is like, play weird stuff. Play, like, lots of kind of stuff. It ends up working out really well for you. Don't just play the things that everybody says is important. There we go. You want that moonberry. The peeking in the window scene is optional. I don't have to do it. For those of you who are curious about what's happening in chat, if you go up over here to Aika's house and examine this. Vise is like, what the hell is this thing? He's confused by it. It's blocking a hole. And you can see Aika with her hair down. Shocking. Still not great, <laughs> but there's definitely a ver like a worse version of that. Do I want to do hide and seek with these little rascals? Do I? I forget what they tell you. like where people train and fight yeah there's definitely so I, i'm not saying a peeping scene is a good thing um i don't think they are but there's definitely a lesser game that turns that into something lewd especially a modern game that could turn that into something particularly lewd really good music here for this town though just want to walk around and see some of this area. Again, remember, verticality. This game does it really, really well. Oh, 
There's a huge place that we're going to go up to in a story sequence very quickly. We'll go really high up. You'll see. First, let's talk to our mom. Only downside... The only thing I don't like about Vise's mom is that she, she's only ever called Vise's mom. I don't think you ever learn her name. I've played this game like 14 times or something, and it's always Vise's mother. Give a lady a name, game. You're pretty good about giving everybody else a, a nice little bit of agency. Why don't you give the, the wonderful kind lady some agency, too? That is the most nitpicky of complaints I've ever made, but, you know. But it's nice. This game starts off pretty... Like, we have that swashbuckling opening... Now we got some, like, quieter char character stuff, which is good. I really like it. The thing they don't clue you in on is, I believe you just have to start going up here for the next story scene. But look at that again. Nice colors. Oh, you saw me save? Yeah, I save constantly in RPGs. Even though I know where all the boss fights are and stuff. Um... It's just habit. Like, why would I not save every second when I'm playing an RPG? I believe our sto next story sequence is up here, and it's a nice one. The game doesn't really tell you, though. Good music, good colors, good characterization, strong moment here. It's a fucking good game. And it gets you an idea of, like, what Vise's deal is, too. And, like, how aspirational um, his whole deal is. He says, I want to know what's beyond the sunset. Fina might have something to say about that, but not at the moment. But Vise is like, hey, let's just go. And that's cool. That's a nice sentiment. It's really honest. I don't know. I appreciate that honesty in ways that I can't really express. It's really nice. It's nice to have characters who do good things and they do them for honest reasons. Um, it's just really nice. I also like the character expressions on all these characters. Like, there's only, like, a handful of faces for each of them, but they work out really well. Oh yeah, by the way, Vise's eye patch is telescopic. The more you know. And now we get our first opening story quest, which is like, hey, a moonstone fell, that's valuable, let's go. Which again, really good stuff. And we get our word, word, world building stuff. Rocks fall from the moon. There are multiple different moons in Arcadia. We will get to see a lot of them. So we'll go to our first dungeon. I think I'll play through that first dungeon and that'll be the end of it today. I'm not like running out of steam or anything, but you know. They're so good. All three of them. Good, honest people.
A wonderful, idyllic hometown. I would live the shit out of a log cabin on a floating island. So we'll talk about the dungeon design a bit when we get there. The key thing that I'm going to keep repeating throughout whatever playthrough we do is just... Oh yeah, the game's really good about this too. It doesn't really tell you that you can interact with something, you just kind of have to check. Um, a lot of it's obvious and kind of intuitive though, which is nice. He's gonna give me, I think, the purple moonstone. Yeah. We're gonna give that to Aika pretty quickly. It's ice and status effects. Why not play the GameCube version? The audio is better in this version. I should probably make a Moobot thing just for that. Um, I want my soundtrack to sound good. God damn it. Like it better. And if it don't, what's the point? So we're going to go to Moonstone Island. Yeah, the game's kind of pricey now. Legends is also pricey. Legends, I should have brought back with... So I was just with my family on vacation, and I should have grabbed Legends. Do I have it here? I swear to Christ. One second. Killer 7. Twin Snakes. I think it's back at my at my other uh with my family. That's bullshit. I have a copy of it somewhere. The Dreamcast was super easy to play pirated games on. It was easy to uh, play emulated stuff on, too. Like, the Bleem cast was a thing. Let's go to Shrine Island. There was an officially licensed emulator that uh, played um, that played Metal Gear Solid. Hey, Ava. I see you in chat. Uh, th some of those scan lines are actually um, slightly artificially added by me on my frame meister. It actually has a setting to put some extra scan lines if you want them. I, I've spaced out my lines a little bit more than I need to. A looper. We'll try some magic attack first. Is it going to run? No, it's going to use magic on me. I'm surprised it didn't run. This might... If Ika hits it, it'll be a miracle. You should see... If you look on my Twitter right now, you can see what the VMU shows. Oh, yeah. It did not take much damage there. It's gonna run? It's attacking. Do I get a counterattack? Because that would kill it instantly. Hey, we got it, actually. So we're gonna get some experience here. Looper battles are weird. Oh, Mubot just said it. So that should get us a level up for Ika, certainly. Uh, loopers also give a lot of magic experience is their big thing. So, there we go. 
So you lose, or um, you gain magic for everybody based upon what crystals you have. The more people are using the same crystal, the more experience in that thing you get. But also if you're just, if your character is specifically carrying that type of crystal, they will get experience too. So the reason that Ika even got um, Red Moonstone experience there is because Vise was carrying a Red, red Moonstone. Some people tell me that they prefer Grandia 2's combat to this. I don't know if I agree with that. Not a big fan of it. Let's keep on going, keep on going. So, I mean, I know some of the people who worked on this game, certainly. Um, like, one of the main writers and producers is this fellow named Shuntaro Tanaka, who, to my understanding, is no longer with Sega. Um, there is an apocryphal story that when he saw the Rogue's Landing level in Sonic All-Star Racing Transform, it made him cry. Because it was that uh, beautiful to him. There's also another designer on this game called Reiko Kodama, who I think... Tim knows. Um, she's worked on things like Fantasy Star and a couple other things as well. Um, I'm saving again. And then it's like Sega and Overworks, but I don't know all the specifics. I'm trying to look up some of it now. Who still, still owns the right to this game? It has to be Sega because they've used these characters in the past in, mul in multiple uh, versions of their games. You can play as Vice in Sonic All-Star Racing Transformed. You can... Uh, Vise, Ika, and Fina are characters in uh, the first Valkyria Chronicles. Our first level. So this is nice because we get to see that this game likes to have dungeons with a lot of... Um, and I say this fondly. Um, sort of exploration-based gimmicks. Uh, in this case, the thing we need to get to is flooded. Uh, it's down in the bottom. Um, when it crashed in here, it uh, flooded the water. So now we need to deal with the water somehow. We will find a way to drain the water, and that is how we are going to take care of this. In order to do that, we need to move around the space in a lot of cool, complicated ways, which is very, very nice. Um, opening doors, draining water, that sort of thing. Um, starts you off in a really nice position uh this is great like just in general um it's not the same way of um you know in breath of the wild where you have the castle there as this as this weenie that you're supposed to look at all the time um but this is a nice example of level design that's guiding you very quickly and directly to where you need to go um that's solid. That's good. That's space. That means that the space is being considered, right? Um, remember, too, that, you know, this is a game that's coming out when we're still kind of experimenting in a lot of ways with 3D space. Um, not in the sense that we're still getting to know it like we were with the PlayStation random encounter coming up uh, with the PlayStation or the um, Nintendo 64, but we're getting into that period of this and the PlayStation 2 where we start to actually see what we can do with 3D space and 3D spatial design in ways that we weren't really doing on those earlier consoles. Um, to that end, we have a lot of the stuff that's happening in the combat system where we're using camera movements that are more dynamic and more exciting. Counterattack could get that looper. Fantastic. Um, but it's all. it also means that, you know, we're seeing in this game, an, an opportunity where it experiments with space and um, design and sort of conveyance of where you need to go in a space. In this case, it's very simple. There's a giant fucking crystal right where we need to go. Um, but, you know, it's going to get more complicated uh, from there on. Um, obviously, this is not stuff that had not been done in games before this generation. Um, otherwise, Zelda's uh, dungeon design, Ocarina of Time's dungeon design, uh, wouldn't occasionally be so great, um, even though sometimes it's not great. 
uh, shadow temple I'm looking at you um, but this is the start of a game you know alongside a lot of other games where we're starting to see um, more complicated spaces um, instead of just a dungeon we have a dungeon with more mechanisms and we have um, a dungeon with certain complexities and gimmicks, things that transform. We're going to go around the outside of the dungeon. We're going to go underneath the dungeon, into the sky area underneath the dungeon. Um, a lot of stuff. Oh my gosh. If I was, if I could find a way to stream Pinta's Quest, I'd do it. There's a ch jam here eventually that we need to get to. But we just transformed the entire dungeon space, right? The thing that's being men mentioned in the chat, Pintus Quest, is so the visual memory unit, which is your controllers, which is your memory card for the um, Dreamcast, has an image on it, and you can play stuff on it like you're playing something with like a Tamagotchi. Um, and in this case, Pintus Quest is a thing where you can send in. Uh, send a character of your crew that you eventually get once you have your own ship and you can send them on adventures and then bring them back into your game and they will sometimes give you items um, including things like moonberries which is kind of a big deal um this care this uh this allotment of characters here has reminded me that i need to unlock alpha storm on ica in a second because i have two moonberries this should kill them all yeah. One potential option for tattoos was also to get certain That's fun. Uh, of those spell glyphs, but I settled for getting Fina's tattoos instead. Curia crystal, very nice. Um, so special abilities, super moves. Alpha Storm, great. Uh, Delta Shield, even better. Those are going to be very, very useful for us. Um, Vice doesn't get like a very useful special ability until he gets Reign of Swords again. But I think you still have to get like that one where he has the pirate guy help him. But Delta Shield is a fantastic skill, and you'll see why in a second. Random Encounter coming up. But I hope as I move around this space, even though I'm not talking about it in like a big, large, sort of exegetical way, um, you'll understand why I have such an appreciation for it. Um, it's adding complexity in a space that did not necessarily have to be complex. Um, and instead, it makes you... So, if I can quote Mark Brown for a second. Hi, my name is Mark. This is Boss Keys. Um, Mark, whose opinions I don't always agree with, but I tend to agree with very often. Um, one of the things that he stresses in Boss Keys is this, this idea of navigating a space. And then having to re-navigate a space, which is not an observation that you know, is uniquely his. But the observation there, quite correctly, is that... Um, learning a space and then getting to re you know sort of experience it in different contexts and um sort of really mapping out your way through a space is a way to engage with that space um with a little bit more richness and a little bit more complexity than if i was just running down a tunnel right um that's one of the things that makes at least for mark when he's talking about it certain zelda dungeons more interesting than others they kind of make you go back and around and loop and memorize things we never get anything quite that complex in skies of arcadia we have a couple things that come really close there's a dungeon later on where there's even more water uh, it's a very complicated dungeon uh, one of the reasons i catch catch fish too is so i can heal myself but they don't give me a lot um in the meantime, we can use uh, Ica's magic. Um, but sort of learning how to navigate space and then re-navigate space is important. Um, and I think Skies of Arcadia gets that. Like, it does a pretty good job with it.
Yeah, you can do prophecy. You can do blue rogues. Hold on one second, I have a phone call. Hello? Oh my gosh, hi machine. My order is ready? I was told that my order would be ready on Wednesday. So it looks like I'm going to the pharmacy later. So here we go. Uh, first off, a uh, special uh, random encounter coming. Um, but also, hey, uh, look at that. We're back in an outside space. And also that space is vaguely contiguous from navigating the world map and then going into the battle map, which is great. Um, some games would have probably made you go into some kind of abstract space instead. We don't want that. We want something that actually um, kind of implies a solid real world. And in that case, that means, hey, this world kind of persists from when you're exploring it in the world map to when you're in battle. Uh, I probably shouldn't be using red magic against all these blue magic clowns. Should probably switch to something else, but you know, whatever. Um, so this is tricky because I need to position Ika properly and this will probably be my best bet. So this is Alpha Storm. Yeah, there, it's going to hit both of them. Uh, it's great for getting through dungeons. Funny how that works. Funny how the freaking skills that are given to you throughout uh, the distribution of your party members all serve really good functions. Vise is a good uh, boss buster. Ika is good for trash mobs. It's useful. There is a character who fights with a rapier. His name is... Uh, his name is Enrique. Yeah, see, if I had changed from the red crystal there, I probably would have killed it in, in a hit there. That might confuse me. That has a chance of uh, confusing me. Counterattack. You like the gun guy more? You like Gilder? Gilder's cool. We'll do a Cutlass Fury on this guy. For those of you who are maybe not around to see it when we used it on the first boss. You can skip these animations too. I'm, I just let them run so that you guys can see the good stuff. And uh, it's the good stuff. To quote my friend uh, Tim Rogers, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the good stuff. That right there, here in daddy's bingo. I want to be able to do a, um, a stream of this with Tim to join me to talk about the game's design at some point. I'm in my apartment in Brooklyn right now. I'm not at uh, our offices in Manhattan. Oh, uh, no, we're gonna... Don't worry, we're gonna talk about Skies of Arcadia. Yeah. I'm fairly certain he knows Reiko Kodama, which means that I might ask Tim to help me get in touch with her to ask her questions about Skies of Arcadia. <laughs> but look at that, even more depth and verticality. We're pushing mechanisms, we're getting rid of water, we're tracking that sort of mentally, but we're also, again, seeing the proper scale of a place by going outside, around it, lower, deeper into it. Um, it implies a sense of scale. It implies an actual sense of place. It gives us a sense that we are dealing with a place that has a sort of internally consistent architecture, which is just fantastic, right? That's what we want. Um, we want that stuff in games all the time. I didn't mean to attack the looper. Oh, well. Yeah, I also, so I, one time I looked into trying to figure out what happened to Shintaro Tanaka and he's not at Sega, but he's somewhere and just getting in touch with Shintaro Tanaka would be like, it's doable. I just need to sit down and do the goddamn journalism. 
Um, which I can. But I have an easier line, at least initially, to talk to, um, I would hope, um, Reiko Kodama. Is this going to hit both of them? It's going to be a tight call. Yes, South Ocean going into Ixotaka. The boss of this dungeon? Oh, you'll see, friend. Critical hit. At least it woke me up. The, uh, the nice thing about Skies of Arcadia is, um, here, I'm going to drop this into chat for a second so you can see it, just because I wanted to grab it for my own perusal, is here's the, um, here's the actual chart of how magic works in this game. Somebody says, you'll visit Kotaku again if you interview, if I interview this dev. You should check Kotaku out more often. A lot of people are like, oh, Kotaku fucking sucks. I don't read it. And you know what? I work there and I do good work. And so do my coworkers. So maybe you give it a try. So this guy is, I believe, purple, which means that I want something that's strong against purple, which would be green. I should use a special attack there, but I don't think I need to here. That might kill it. You know, I tell people, so like I, I play a lot of online games and I'm pretty open about who I am when I play things online. Um, you know, they say like, hey, what do you do? And I tell them I'm a, um, <laughs> you know, I tell them I'm a journalist. I tell them I work for, work for Kotaku. And sometimes people will say like, hey, I don't like that site. And I say, well, maybe, try giving it another go because it's not 2009 or whatever thing that made you mad and you should just go for it there is good journalism out there not just from us there is good journalism out there um, and you're never gonna know if you bury your head in the sand and just don't check on it not to say that you're burying your head in the sand I'm talking generally Here's a cool thing, though. Look at that thing over there in the water. Hmm, interesting. Interesting little thing. Let's go get this treasure chest. Wait. Oh, I got a... Random encounter? My Dreamcast was worrying. Let's go here first to get down there to... Yeah... No, I don't think he's killing that. I don't think he's killing the ecosystem of the island. I think he's draining the water from the temple itself only. I don't think that... Does the lake fully drain? I don't recall. Um, that would be wild. This is a silver creature. Silver has um, essentially preternaturally high defense against a lot of stuff. The only thing that silver is weak to is um, yellow. So we're just going to fight this thing. Whoa! Hitting me real hard there, buddy. God, I don't have enough for Cutlass Fury right now. I'm so used to having my characters at a high enough level that they can just Cutlass Fury constantly. Can't happen. I'm shifting in my chair. Um, one thing that I do not like about this game, though, uh, is um, if your character is knocked unconscious, they do not gain experience. It is a uh, heartbreaking state of affairs. So you want to keep your characters alive as much as possible. 
Somebody named their dog Vice? That's great. For those of you who don't know, <laughs> there's a there's an article about the tattoo I got recently from this game. Have I played the extra dungeons on the GameCube version? Yeah, I've played through like tons of the GameCube version. I fought Air Pirate Vigoro and all that stuff, um, but I still like playing the original more because I'm a um, I'm a stubborn little bitch. Fifty percent revive, Ryzan. Yeah, it's maybe not the best. So we gotta head down here again. Random encounter? Yeah, there it is. I should put a mic next to the Dreamcast so that you can hear when the uh, motor starts whirring, so you can tell when I'm getting <laughs> um, encounters as well. I'm just gonna level up until we can have that first turn alpha storm. And then suddenly our lives get a lot easier. That guy survived by a single bit of health, really. So yeah, so magic, special attacks end up being having a higher premium than magic in this game, but magic can still do some things that special attacks don't always do. Um, because magic is available pretty quickly, um, and some of the best things that you, ha that you have for abilities just isn't, right? Oh, it defended. It ran? Fuck you. Yeah, so I don't know if I have as much super exciting stuff to say right now. Besides, uh, I'll get there when we get to the boss. But in general, this first dungeon is a really good look. Um, or it builds upon the lesson that we learned very quickly initially with the first dungeon. Um, going outside of Alfonso's ship, which is that this game is very good about, again, contigu contiguous space and keeping everything kind of on the level and then making you go. Um up and down and inwards and depths and everything. My holiday adventure stories? My dog got me a PlayStation 4 Pro. Little son of a bitch. So I'm replaying the early levels of Hitman 2, and maybe I'll stream those a little later tonight. The thing that pisses me off about that is that I had completed the first elusive um, contract, which was the Sean Bean contract, and I don't have, like, because it's locked to the thing that you used it on. So I was playing on the Xbox, which means I have that content unlocked on the Xbox, but I don't have it on my PlayStation, and I'm kind of bummed about that. You should have a giant, you, ha you can have an IO interactive account, but really what that should do is give you a giant, um, like way to sync all your data so you don't lose any of your cool items that you get from elusive targets or whatever but hey that's probably a lot of work oh god his critical attacks are fantastic all right Ika. let's go girl Oh, you should finish the game, my friend. Go back and refinish the game. It's, uh... This game has a great ending. If anything else, go do yourself a favor. Go watch the game's credits and listen to some of the most beautiful music that's ever been made for a game. What the fuck is that? Are you kidding me? Why is there... Who... Whose channel has Vise and Ica? What? Holy shit. Oh my god. So somebody, for those of you who aren't paying attention or can't see chat for whatever reason, somebody dropped Ika and Vi's emotes in our chat. Lithero. Do they have a Fina one? That'd be amazing. Jesus Christ. That's awesome. That's super good. Wow. 
That's rad. That's really good. Like, they're really high quality, too. Oh, man, that's so good. Yeah, is it the Goku guy? If so, that's even better. So we're almost near the end of the uh, the dungeon here. Because you can see where the water is. He has no interest in a Fina emote? Bullshit. Tell him the world's biggest skies of Arcadia fan is pissed. Yeah. See, look at that, what happens when I actually change my elements to work. I actually probably should have changed Ika to... Uh, green there as well. Yeah, see, that's what I'm thinking too. You can't have just like two of them. You gotta have all of them. They're a trio. They come as a pack. It's like getting a Reese's but having no peanut butter in it or whatever. It's not a Reese's. It's just a bunch of bullshit chocolate. Oh, we got an item. Thank the Lord. Maraca shell should just be a defense item. So we'll give that to Vise. It's so funny. It actually lowers my hit. Oh, well, that's because the goggles increase my hit. That can have an effect on my crits. So maybe I'll give this to Aika. Yeah, I can do that for now. The first figure's Vi statue? Yeah, I've seen that and I've thought about buying it, but I'm sure it cost me it will cost me like four hundred bucks or some shit now. I really want it. Um I know exactly the figure that you're talking about. Isn't there only like a handful of them in existence anyway? Yeah, I would put that on my desk immediately. The only thing I have at my desk is I have a Tracer Figma, because I actually like Tracer even though I have complicated feelings towards Overwatch. And then I have uh, <laughs> a Tracer little keychain thing and an Anna little keychain thing I got from uh, my my ex uh, my ex-girlfriend. Uh, the, the Tracer one is brand new. She gave it to me for Christmas. Keep in touch with people who are important in your life, by the way. There we go. So this is going to bring us to the boss fight. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I would have to be so careful with that statue, especially in New York. Also, my room is... F it's so full of stuff. I live in, like, a closet. It's Garby Garbo. So here we go. The Moonstone. And our next boss. Which is actually really cool, because we got to see our boss, too. Look at that. Fun little game design thing. Not only did we see our destination, we saw our boss before we got to it, too. too. We just didn't know it was the boss yet. That's cool. That's great. They're silver aspected, though, which means I cannot do a lot of damage to them with, like, elemental stuff. So instead, I just have to do the normal shtick of building up my spirit points. Does this thing use Eternus or anything like that? It might have access to instant death magic, which would suck. Yeah, if it has Eternity or something, I'll be really mad. One second. All right, somebody was sending me a message. 
They sent me a big message. They killed my father. He sleeps with the fishes. Uh, Cutlass Fury. Yeah, it would seem super early to have instant death, but you never know. Actually, this will be a big damage turn because I can hit it with Crystalli. Like, that's decent damage, all things considered, for a one magic spell. And now, there we go. Cutlass Fury. good stuff. It's gonna use Blaster though. I think this travels in a line too, which is why it's good that it's just just Vi's getting hit here. I think this is kind of an easy game, yeah, but it's never felt like a simple game to me. I'm actually gonna use a Sacris Crystal on Vi's now. Like, this is not an impossible boss fight. She's got to push through it. Our next turn should give me enough for Cutlass Fury. So, once again. We just do kind of a damage turn. I wish I had Increm, which is the damage buff skill, but we haven't unlocked it yet. But this should take this thing down to about half health. A little over. Counterattack? Thank you, baby. Thanks, Vise. I didn't somehow get Increm on here, did I? No. He knows Sakri now, so if I really need to heal... There we go. Actually, we're over the mark, so it's going to do opportunity now, because we did the damage on this attack. Listen to the music change! Nice camera movements, dynamic music. Fucking great. Every single second you spend with this game is an absolute delight. I've never played a game that I enjoy more, moment for moment, except maybe, oh, I sh don't have a magic drop. Do I still have a magic drop? No, I don't. Except maybe like a Devil May Cry game or something for raw enjoyment. Cannot wait for Devil May Cry 5. Yeah, so a handful of turns and we'll get this done. And we'll know, so the thing I didn't do when it attacked me last, so now it's gonna do a target search. And assuming it's gonna attack Vi's, I'm actually gonna defend. And in the meantime, I'm gonna cure him back up to basically full health. Let's try this. It's possible that he attacks Ika here. He is. That could knock her out. Not quite, but see, if I didn't defend there with Vi's, I would have eaten damage too. Yeah, so... I don't know... I can't maneuver my characters into, like, position, necessarily. I can't be like, Ika, go up there. She just does shit. Unless there's new mechanics in this game that I never learned about. Don't counterattack. Resident Evil 2 Remake is going to be dope as hell, too. I cannot wait for Mr. X to, like, choke me to death. That's going to be scary as shit when you're playing Claire's story. And it just so happens to have a killer murder dude. This might kill Ika. Oh, now we're getting into a uh, crisis music.
Yeah, I guess I'm gonna burn the magic on Vi's to do this here. He's got the vice thing in the chat. Oh. oh, I love it. Come to all my streams when I play through this, please. We'll bring it back here in a second. If this doesn't give us opportunity again, I'll be shocked. Counterattack. So one more, one more time. Would a Skies of Arcadia remake be a good idea? I don't think a remake would be what I would want. Uh, a remaster, sure. This could actually end the fight. Yeah, wow, nice counterattack, guys. Holy shit. Yeah! I would rather them just do what they did with Shenmue. Ah, oh, another Moonberry. There's, like, I'm sure there's some sort of reason, like a monetary evaluation thing about why they're not putting this game out there, but they, like, what the fuck? The day that this gets announced for, for like, a remake is the day I break down crying in front of all my coworkers. You have no fucking idea. Um, oh my god, it would just... It would destroy me. It absolutely... The idea, just the sheer idea that maybe other people will finally get introduced to this thing and not have to play it secondhand, like... watching me or something. Good stuff. We got the raw moonstone. Got some bad news coming up soon, though. This is a JRPG, and it is a very nice hometown. I believe we all know what happens to those. I do like what they do with the camera here. He's gonna look, uh, he's gonna bend. And, st and stretch. And then... Like, this is a neat little thing. I don't know, it's a funny... I remember this. He bends and then you see his perspective of the ships coming in upside down. I always like that moment. But here's the thing, it's not, it's not going to be this thing where it's like, my hometown was slaughtered and everything's done. Uh, Vice and Ica bounce back from this very easy, easily. They're like, hey, let's go help people and save them. And it's great. And also, I think this is the first time we see Galcian. Yeah, it is. Or at least, this is the first time we hear Galcian's name. Yeah, so this is Galcian and Ramirez. I have complicated thoughts about Galcian and Ramirez that we will get to in time. Uh, Galcian is a very good villain. Ramirez, also a very good villain. Retrieve the girl and bring her to me. Capture the air pirates. We'll need to interrogate them when we return to Valua. Be sure to destroy their ship as well. And then he says, if they resist, what do you do? I don't think they're foolish enough to resist, but if something should happen... Burn the village and kill them all. Let the bodies rot in the sun and leave one of our flags to set an example for others who may defy us. I love him. By that I mean, he's... he's 
villainous and cunning and cruel, but he's also not immediately killing everybody. This is a this is a guy uh, who's got stuff going on upstairs, uh, but in a good way. And then Ramirez, oh boy, oh boy, Ramirez. I'm gonna talk through for real some like legit shit with Ramirez eventually. Oh, there's gonna be whole sections of this playthrough where I'm going around just getting like discoveries and crew members. By the way. So be prepared for that. I'm going to unlock Vice's next attack, actually, because that'll get me closer to Reign of Swords, which I want. Oh, actually, well, here's the thing. If I save the Moonberry now, friends, friends who have played the game before, if I save the Moonberry now, um... Which way am I going again? Yeah, this way. Could I... Because Drachma doesn't start with his special attacks, right? And if I get Drachma soon, I might want Tackle as soon as possible. So... But Reign of Swords is a very good attack. How many Moonberries do I have? Ugh. I hate this one. But we'll do it. Counter-Strike is not that interesting an attack. It just gives grants you an automatic counter to any to any physical attack, not to magic attacks. Alright. Let's pick this up. Magic droplets. Fantastic. Also, nice use of silence here. The game will do this again later in another uh, moment. That's actually really smart. It's the little things I like. L like, for real, legit. I'm going to save again immediately. sure I can get another Moonberry pretty quickly after Drachma joins, so I don't need... I need Tackle for the Executioner battle. I don't need Tackle for everything leading up to that. And I'm pretty sure you get a Moonberry in the sewers, so... Mm, I'm okay with that. The thing about Reign of Swords is that it, do, it gets a little bit outmoded by the fact that like when you get Lambda Burst. Um, just because Ika's area of attack abilities are, um, like, I don't know, they're just, they're pretty good already, and it's, and Lambda Burst, I believe, is cheaper than Reign of Swords anyway. But whatever, I had the Spare Moonberry. Where's me mom? Yeah, Lambda Burst is eight. I think it, I think Lambda Burst is gonna cost me two Moonberries though. So they got taken by Valua. Yeah, I just don't remember the exact SP values. I've played this game a ton. It is my favorite. So they've been taken to Valua. Um, the audio dramas only last until the rescue in Valua and the escape from the uh, Grand Fortress, and that's it. Um, and I like I like this. What should we do? It's a choice, and of course the correct choice, because this is the best game, is... Fucking let's go! What are we gonna do? Uh, we're gonna go back to the world's craziest prison, and save our friend, and save our dad, and save fucking everyone. Which is great. Like, let's do it. 
There is no moping in this game, even when there is moping. And she's smart too. The mom is like, hey, don't just rush, like plan a little bit, make sure you're set and ready for your journey. Like it's smart, ch I don't know, man. Like, this game's fucking good. It's too good. Gorgeous, gorgeous. The, oh, the serpent. For a minute I thought it was the, mono the Monoceros, but that's Ramirez's ship when he eventually becomes a uh, an admiral. I like the idea that this guy's just like, Well, Gassian, as you ordered, I brought the girl to see you. Because of his stupid helmet. As you wish, sir. What did you say? I said, I think if you can identify yourself. Good moment, too. He says, at last we meet, Fina. And you go, excuse me? <gasps> Supreme Commander of the Imperial Armada. I love this nonsense. Like his big ass cape. There are two sides to Valua. There's like all the shit that happens with Gaussian and some of the other, and some of the admirals, and then there's like all the foppish aristocrats, which is just Alfonso and to an extent Empress Theodora. Not even to an extent, like a lot, Empress Theodora. Look at how good some of these airship designs are. They get even better. Don't worry. It's going to take us a little bit to get to airship battles, though. Um, a bit perturbing. But actually, you know what? I'm going to save the game because I think this is... I think this is where we stop for today, friends. Um... I'm going to start saving these on our Twitch channel. So if you, for whatever chance, um, miss uh, a showing of this, you can watch it. I recommend going back and watching some of my Metal Gear playthroughs if you want to see a thing where I do a lot of criticism, but I'm also really enthusiastic. And unfortunately, uh, my gameplay's a little off in those ones, but you know, whatever. Um, I should have my retrospective of Metal Gear 2 by the end of the month. Uh, January. Um, and we'll keep going with that series, and eventually I'll find a way to metabolize all my thoughts about this and actually write about this game, but I want to share this with you. Um, this game is not just something I think is a good video game. Um, it is quite seriously um, probably the piece of media that changed my life the most outside of like shit like the Bible. Um, uh, this game is great. It's fantastic. I don't have the words to adequately express um, in any way, shape, or form how much it means to me. But I hope that my enthusiasm and my playthrough here, um, and my continued playthrough, will try will um, will somehow communicate to you the uh, the value of of what I see in this game, <clears throat> and we'll go from there. Otherwise, I'm gonna go. I'm going to relax, and I will see you all around. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful New Year's. Goodbye.